Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Hello again, and welcome to the Psalm 91 study in our journey through the key chapters of the Bible. As we've been going through God's Word together, we've been learning all kinds of spiritual principles that just challenge us to not listen to the message of the world, but to let God's Word teach us about life and reality and just what it means to live by faith in light of what God has said. And one of the most persistent messages of the world is that death and danger are random and inevitable and there's nothing you can do about it. You know, when you watch a movie, they either portray death as something insignificant where like a, a dozen bad guys just get killed in the scene. Or maybe it's just the most tragic event of all time and the camera goes into slow motion and, and the violins pluck at our heartstrings. The reality is that life and death are, are just not subject to random events, uh, no matter what the movies tell us. And today we're working through Psalm 91. We're just going to see how it points us to God's protective care over his people. Now, as we go to Psalm 91, we don't know who wrote this psalm, nor do we really know the occasion, but it may have been written for soldiers going to battle, and it's often read by soldiers even today. It covers the kinds of dangers in biblical days, but it equally applies to any of the dangers that we might find in our day, whether it's sickness or problems at work or, or just going down the road. And as we go through this psalm, we'll learn that we can find refuge in God, knowing that nothing will harm us that is outside of his will for us, because he watches over us and protects us. Now, the challenge when reading this psalm is that it lays out a number of promises that at first might seem too good to be true. And that's why we need to understand what kind of literature this is. In the past, we've used the term gnomic literature or gnomic wisdom. You might remember that gnomic is spelled G-N-O-M-I-C, and it's used of literature that explains the way things tend to go. Gnomic literature is a bit like promises, but it's more actually like following instructions for like growing seeds or things like that, where if you follow the steps, then you're going to have the promised results. You're going to have that harvest. And so just as a farmer banks his livelihood on the fact that the seeds he plants will grow healthy and well and yield an entire harvest, so too we can spread the seeds of this psalm into our life and know that they will produce within us a spiritual harvest as well. And if and when there are exceptions, those exceptions are by God's design and for his specific purposes. They are not random and they are not without cause. And so gnomic literature is extremely instructive. And the wise person doesn't cast aside this teaching just because 0.01% of the seeds don't produce life. Instead, they order their lives. They plant these seeds throughout their life according to God's instructions and trust in the harvest that he promises here. And so as we go to Psalm 91, we're going to be seeing just how God promises to protect his people. And so now let's dive into Psalm 91 and let's look at the assurances that this psalm gives us about God's watchful care. Verse 1 opens saying, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. That phrase, Most High, is just a poetical way of saying the Lord and just points to his supremacy over all that exists. And to dwell in his shelter means to seek and find refuge in him alone and not in anything else or anyone else. The psalmist is so confident in the Lord, that's where he puts his trust. And he says in verse 2, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Now that word refuge there means that God is our protective shelter. That's just this idea there of a place we can go to when the storms of life start raging. The word fortress speaks of something like a mountain stronghold, a place where we can run to and know that it is safe and secure, where we can withstand any enemy attack. And so the idea here is just of just trusting the Lord, waiting for him, seeking his protection, his deliverance, and his guidance. And all of this points to the way that God's people handle adversity. When life's storms and attacks come their way, they gather with the Lord. They come to him. They seek him. They make sure that they are walking with him, that he might fight their battles and he might keep them safe. And then as we go on to this psalm, pretty much the rest of this psalm, or at least most of it, is going to tell us why the psalmist seeks the Lord in the midst of adversity. In verse 3, the Lord delivers us from traps and diseases. Now that word disease is there, or pestilence, it's related to the word speak, actually. And it's nearly always used in terms of in the Old Testament where God warns of diseases that are going to come as judgment. For instance, in 2 Chronicles 7.13, the Lord even says he may send pestilence as a way of getting his people's attention to repent. And so the people who make God their refuge and trust in him and walk in his covenant, they'll be protected from such things. Going on to verse 4, verse 4 says the Lord covers us with his pinions. 
And that's just another way of saying wings. And, and it might be a reference, although it says it's his pinions. Some believe it might be a reference to the most holy place in the tabernacle or the temple where the ark was and these two giant winged cherubim keeping watch with the, the, the covenant. It might be either way, just this idea that we can go to God and he's going to just protect us and watch over us. Verse 5 says we can trust God in the nighttime. And nighttime is just those times when we're most vulnerable, where we have to sleep, we have to rest, we can't see well. We can trust him. We can even trust him when the arrows start flying. In verse 6, we do not have fear when it comes to the threat of diseases. And that's that same word for pestilence back in verse 3. In verse 7, even as these terrors are spreading to everyone around us, if we are walking with God, uh, then we can just know that he will watch over us, protect us. And instead in verse 8, that person will see the destruction going on all around him or her and be reminded of the supreme value of following the Lord. We see that in verse 9. Verse 9 returns to the certainty of God's protection. Verse 9 and 10 says, For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. And verses 11 and 12 then give us an added reason for our confidence in God. It says, those who trust in the Lord have his angels protecting them. It says, for he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against the stone. Now that might sound familiar because Satan used this very verse when he was tempting Jesus to jump off the top of the temple. But you'll remember in that passage in Matthew 4, Jesus answered him quickly with Deuteronomy 16:16, 16, 16, saying, we're not to put the Lord to the test. And so we don't jump from things to see if God will override the laws of nature, but we do trust that God's angels are near to watch over us and protect us. Now, for what it's worth, this is one of those key verses people go to for the idea of guardian angels. And I do think that angels protect God's people, but scripture doesn't really tell us that there's a specific angel who kind of hangs around with us and pals around, kind of like a like an angelic secret service ready to jump in with this trouble. We don't want to think of angels that way because sometimes people start thinking, well, maybe they should talk to them or keep them entertainment, give them some coffee or something like that, um, pray to them. We don't want to do that. Instead, we just want to just recognize that God does send angels to watch over us and trust that they'll be there when we need them. We're going back to Psalm 91. In verse 13, the Lord's protection even extends to animals that are ultimately under God's sovereign rule says that even the lions and the adders, and not just like poisonous snakes, they're under God's control. And the picture is, is that these animals are laying in wait, or just waiting for that person to come by and just to spring on them. But God will deliver his people from these, these dangers. Even when I go hiking the mountains, I, I watch out for mountain lions and rattlesnakes because they're out here where we live, but we don't live in fear of them. Finally, the psalm finishes in verses 14 to 16 with the Lord's assurances. He tells us in verse 14, because, and this is him speaking, because he, that this is the person of Psalm 91 here, because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him and I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With a long life, I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. You see, the Lord knows those who truly love him and those who do have God's unique promises of protection and deliverance. They have this unique privilege of being able to call out to the Lord and know that he hears them, he hears their prayers, and he answers them. And they will live their lives with satisfaction, just knowing that God has blessed them and watched over them, and they will even see his salvation. They will be saved from the coming judgment that God was bringing upon this world. And so Psalm 91 here is a psalm of, of rich promises of the Lord. It's a psalm filled with truths to live by. It is a psalm to just frame how we view this world through. It's a psalm filled with spiritual seeds that were just, just to plant into our life. And this psalm calls us to love the Lord, to trust in his grace and his protection. And so as we wrap up today, there's a couple of questions we could ponder here. First, how is the health of your love for the Lord? Just think about that for a moment. Do you truly love him like we see here in verse 14? Or, or is your love for him conditional? So many people claim to love the Lord, but their love is basically conditional, where they're loving him because um, they just hope he's going to help them, he's going to protect them. But when he doesn't do what they wanted, you know, they just kind of give him the silent treatment, they turn from him, they go somewhere else. But when we truly love the Lord, we think his ways are best no matter what comes. We praise him and we believe that he deserves to be worshipped. We look around us and we see all of the beauty and all of the joy in this world and we believe and know that that's a reflection of his beauty and his joy that resides with him and that he is good and gracious to all his people and even his enemies for a time at least 
and that he deserves our total worship and praise, and that's why we love him. Along these lines, what or who are you putting your refuge in? When difficult days come and you say to yourself, well, at least I've got this thing that's going on here, what is the this that you might be referring to? Is it a person, a relationship, a thing, an accomplishment? Is it a savings account? Or is it the Lord? This psalm is calling us just to consider where we are placing our confidence. Not in a shield in the battle, not in our bow that shoots the arrows, not in the doctors who give us our medical care, not in fences that keep the world out. And it's not that we should not have these things. I mean, after all, we should not put the Lord to the test. But when it comes to where our confidence is, it's not in ourselves, not in our stuff. It's not in anyone or anything but the Lord. And so if we have that confidence, that's a great thing. But now, have you told God this? Going back to the beginning of the psalm here, it says in verse 2, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. This is what the psalmist says to the Lord. How about you? Have you said things like this to the Lord lately? Have you said, Lord, you are my refuge. You are my fortress. You are the place that I find my protection in life. There's something powerful about simply telling the Lord that you have complete trust in him. In fact, often when we're struggling with our prayer life, we can just start right here. Rather than just like, well, what do I say to God? Or maybe I should just ask God for stuff. How about just starting by proclaiming your trust in him and just recounting all the reasons why, just like you see here in Psalm 91. You know, God hears those prayers and he watches over the people who love him and who trust him and who pray these kinds of things to him. And so as we wrap up our time together, just looking at Psalm 91, let's go back to the Lord, just personally, individually, privately. And let's just go back to him and just set our heart before him, just lay our life before him. Let's just tell him that we're putting our complete trust and confidence in him. And then let us just take the principles of this psalm here and just sow them into our lives, knowing that there is a wonderful spiritual harvest for those who take God at his word and just sow his principles and his truths into their lives. Well, that's it for Psalm 91 for today. Thanks so much for listening. We'll catch up with you tomorrow. Hope you have a great rest of your day. God bless.